Well, welcome everyone. I, my name is Matthew Jones and I'm the Adult Services Coordinator here at Sandwich Public Library. We're so thankful that you've tuned in tonight for this webinar. We're very excited uh, to hear from John and I told him as we were getting started, uh, I, am, I am ready to learn tonight. There's a lot I feel that I don't know and so I'm excited to get uh, some of this information from an expert. Um, so thank you so much for logging on. I'm glad that you're here. Um, I see one person saying they have no sound. Um, you may try closing out and coming back in. Um, that may be one way to attempt to fix that. Or uh, at the bottom left of your screen, you may see an ability to um, add the audio. So go ahead and try that out if you're not able. Um, you can type there in the, the chat box again, which brings me to the chat box and the Q&A box. Um, there is a chat box and a Q&A box. Feel free throughout the program to uh, put comments in there um, to respond. Uh, feel free to drop your name and where you're viewing from. Um, anything, we'd love to hear from you live. And you can put your questions there in the chat box or the Q&A box, either one. And at the end of the program, we'll make sure that John has a chance to respond to as many of those as uh, we're able to. Um, so once again, thanks for logging on. We're excited. And I'm going to welcome our presenter for this evening, Mr. John Gowing. Thank you for coming. Oh, Matthew, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to be with everybody tonight. And uh, thank you, everyone, for giving up uh, an hour of your time to, uh, to listen to this. I, I hope we can have uh, a fun time, given uh, everything that's going on. And uh, before we get going, while everything is going on, I hope you and everybody that you care about is, uh, is well and safe. So the talk tonight, all things British, um, probably better to say some things British and we'd be here forever. But you can see in the center of the screen there, there's a, a blue pin, uh, it's a blue badge. That is the uh, qualification I got in 2008 when I trained to be a tour guide after 32 years as a, a teacher in the, the public system. And this talk is very much based on questions I get asked when I'm taking people around and the bulk of the people I guided were American groups from uh, all over this great country. And these are sort of common questions that I was asked. And now that I'm here, having married a, a lovely American lady in 2017 in a park in Chicago, I thought to myself, well, you know, what, what am I going to do while I'm here? I can't actually guide all the wonderful places back in the UK. So maybe I could bring those things to the, the people here and either remind them of times when, you know, they visited or maybe whet people's appetite to uh, when this is all over, go and go and visit. So let's get started and we'll start with our national flag. Now, everybody calls this the Union Jack. And, uh, you know, who am I to argue? But it isn't actually, it's, uh, it's the Union flag. And this is the, uh, the, 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 the flag of, uh, of the uh, United Kingdom. And what is it a union of then? You know, what are, what are we talking about here? Well, it's a union of England, if you look to the top left, the red cross on the white background, Scotland, the blue background with the white diagonal, and believe it or not, the red diagonal on a white background is the cross of St. Patrick of Ireland. So there's actually no mention of Wales on our national flag because Wales and England were together. And um, if you've seen movies about the, uh, the Revolutionary War and so on, the British Army's flag was the red cross superimposed on the Scottish flag. The red diagonal of Ireland wasn't there because that didn't happen until the early 1800s. Now, when they added the red diagonal to the flag, it was decided that because Scotland had been uh, a member first, if they put the red diagonal as it looks onto the top of that, it would diminish the um, authority of Scotland's seniority. So if I run it back, can you see how the red diagonals are slightly offset? And that can mean that um, the flag can be flown upside down 
by accident. It's not the same way up as down. Now, obviously, the, uh, the American flag, the Stars and Stripes, it's pretty obvious if you fly that upside down. But the Union flag, it isn't. Now, traditionally, when you look at a flag as we're looking at it on the screen, it is assumed that the flag staff, we call it a flag pole, is on the left hand side. So the correct way to fly the Union flag is to have the thick white bar can you see in the top left hand corner the thick white bar at the top of the flagpole that is the correct way up now this is it therefore upside down and you can see the thin line now the number of times when i've been meeting clients in london at their hotel uh, it's a it's a little thing of mine i look up and i see the you know the international flags up there and if they are flying my flag upside down, I normally go into the lobby and have a conversation with someone who's probably from the European Union and has no idea what I'm talking about. But I feel so much better telling them that they're flying it upside down. Actually, um, if you fly it upside down intentionally, it's actually the sign for SOS. It's May Day. And during the Second World War, uh, a couple of islands uh, just off the, uh, the coast of South England, nearer France actually, known as the Channel Islands, they were invaded by the, by the Nazis during the Second World War. And all the Channel Islanders turned their Union flags upside down. It was a kind of, you know, stick it to the Nazis until they pulled them all down and put their, their swastikas up. Uh, if you fly it like this and you have no clue, then it's just ignorance and I will be knocking on your door. Now, another flag that we see, and this is the sovereign's flag. If the queen is in any royal palace, this flag is flown above wherever it is, Windsor Castle, Buckingham Palace, and so on. And you'll see that uh, two quarters, top left, bottom right, are exactly the same. They are the Lions of England. The lion was actually chosen as the symbol of England by King Richard I. Now, um, everybody knows of him as Richard the Lionheart, uh, but pretty much he was the worst king we ever had. He was king for 10 years. He was only in England for about three months and he only spoke French. So he was a bit of a, a, bit of a waste of time. And when he was killed in 1199, his brother, John, my namesake, uh, probably was even worse to the point that he had to be dragged into a field to sign Magna Carta, the Great Charter, the Bill of Rights, of which the American Constitution has some, uh, some elements. Um, but he did at least confirm the lion as the symbol of England. Now, if you look in the top right hand corner, you can see another lion, a red one. Uh, in heraldry terms, that's called a lion rampant. And that is the symbol of Scotland. That was the personal symbol of King James I, who was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who came to the throne on the death of Queen Elizabeth, the last of the Tudors in 1603. And um, he came down from Scotland and he was already King James VI of Scotland, but he became James I of England. And that was the end of the Tudors and the start of the, uh, the Stuarts. And the bottom left-hand corner there is the symbol of Ireland. If you've ever been to a, an airport, you may have seen Ryanair aircraft there. That's their, that's their tail fin, so the symbol of Ireland. So this is the sovereign's flag. And as I mentioned, more often than not, you'll see it on a royal palace uh, when the queen's home. Now, interestingly, a question I'm asked is when we take a group to Buckingham Palace, they may see the Union flag flying over. And people have said to me, oh, the Queen's home, right? And I say to them, well, she would have been prior to 1997. Now, the reason was that prior to 1997, the Union flag flew over Buckingham Palace if Her Majesty was in residence, but there was no flag if she wasn't there. And then we know that um, Princess Diana was killed in, in 97 and the, the whole of the front of the palace became a shrine. Now the Queen was on holiday in Scotland with uh, William and Harry so there was no flag to bring down to half-staff 
and the British people were, were very angry about this. There was no, no sign of respect. And so the system was changed. So now there is always a flag on Buckingham Palace, the Union flag when Her Majesty is not there, and the Sovereign's flag that you can see there when she, when she is. Now, the Union flag will be lowered to half-staff, but the Sovereign's flag is never, ever lowered to half-staff because we are never without a monarch. On the death of the previous monarch, the next monarch takes over um, with their first breath after the last breath of the other. Um, the king is dead, long live the queen, would have been exactly what they said in 1952 when the queen's father, King George VI, died. Okay, so, another common question. What is it all about? The British Isles, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, what is all of that? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you look at this map, you will see Scotland, England and Wales all joined together. So Great Britain is the bit that's all joined together. Okay, so Wales, England and mainland Scotland. The United Kingdom is a political alliance. So if you look to the left, you'll see Northern Ireland there in pink. Northern Ireland uh, is still under British control. Um, the island of Ireland was given independence in the 1920s, but um, the Brits kept six counties in the, in the north. So this is a political alliance, and this is the United Kingdom. And the last one, to save any confusion, the British Isles, is the whole thing that you can see from space, including the island of Ireland, if that makes sense. So that's pretty, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Okay, so the immediate, immediate generational royal family. There is Her Majesty uh, sitting in the middle there. Uh, she was 94 on April the 21st. She is now the world's longest serving monarch. Um, up until a little while ago, uh, she was second to the King of Thailand. And he died a couple of years ago. Her Majesty is now, at 94 years of age, the uh, um, longest ruling monarch. And you'll see there on the left, as we look at it, Prince Charles. Um, he now holds the world record for waiting. And uh, again, a, a common question I'm asked is, you know, will the Queen abdicate, that is, you know, give up the throne and pass it to uh, William and Kate? Because obviously there's still the story with Charles and Diana and Camilla and so on. And of course, the answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, the Queen at her coronation um, on June the 2nd, 1953 in Westminster Abbey, swore to be the monarch until she dies. The only way that um, Charles won't become king is if he dies before his, his mother. And he's only a sprightly 71 at the, uh, at the moment. If you look to the right of Her Majesty sitting there, we have the Duke of Edinburgh. He is now 99 years of age. Uh, a couple of years ago, he stepped back from doing royal duties. I think he was a bit of a slacker, really, because we only probably got about 35,000 royal events out of him. He still had plenty to go. Uh, but he's, um, he's stepped back now, and some of the younger royals are, are taking over. And again, I get asked quite a lot, why isn't he king? You know, when he married the queen, why didn't he become king? Well, in Great Britain, uh, the person who inherits the throne from their um, father or mother is known as the monarch regnant. So the queen inherited the throne because when her father died, George VI, um, he and the queen's mother, they had two daughters, Elizabeth and, uh, and Margaret, no sons. So Elizabeth became queen. When she married the, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, he was elevated to uh, a dukedom because obviously you can't just be a nobody and be married to the, uh, to the queen. But he would not be made king unless he had been the king of another country because it would be disrespectful for us. Let's say the, um, the War of Independence never happened 
you know, you had some other king. If he married the queen, he could stay the king because it would be disrespectful. But because he wasn't a king, he became a, a duke. In fact, he was only made a prince because he moaned to the queen that he felt spare a lot of the time and she was, you know, getting all the, 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 uh, the fame and so on. So she made him a, a, a prince. So that's as high as he gets, I'm afraid. Now, at the back on the left, uh, we have the 60 year old now um, Duke of York. There's Andrew. Uh, he is in deep doo doo at the moment because of the Jeffrey Epstein thing, but we're not going to go in, into that. Uh, he's 60. Uh, in the middle, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal. She's 70. She's had a bit of a reputation as being uh, a little bit snooty and, and stuck up and so on, but she's not like that at all. She's one of the, if not the hardest working royal. She gets through thousands of engagements a, a year and she really takes the, um, the role seriously. And to complete the, the children, on the right is um, Prince Edward. He is the uh, Earl of Wessex and uh, he's 56 now. And um, all the, the sort of royal males joined the, the, the military and he made a bit of a mistake when it was his turn to do his uh, service uh, because he joined the Royal Marines. That's a bit like the, um, the Green Berets and Navy Seals and so on. And um, he flunked out of his training and all the newspapers were saying that he was weak and, and so on. Well, you know, first of all, he picked one of the hardest regiments in the British Army to join. And I'm not sure I'd have got through the first day. So he, he did a couple of months. So uh, uh, he, he changed career and um, got into uh, a company with the composer, Andrew Lloyd Webber. But uh, again, that's for another day. So it's the immediate, the immediate family. Now, everybody says the Queen always looks miserable when you see photographs of her. Well, I'm not sure I wouldn't be if I had to shake hands all day, every day with hundreds of people. But she, she is far from miserable. And this photograph was taken when she was at the races. Uh, the Queen is a, an excellent horsewoman. She still rides today, even at 94. And uh, she knows a lot about um, horses. And she has some race horses as well. And it's said that, you know, when she goes to the races, she's like a, she's like a little girl again. So she's not miserable. I won't, uh, I won't hear that. So that's a lovely photograph of Her Majesty. Now, you'll all remember this. Sorry, it's a bit blurry. It's from the BBC. Uh, this was in 2012. Uh, London, the great honour of being the uh, only city in the world to be awarded the Olympic Games on three occasions. So this was 2012. The opening ceremony, you know, we didn't have as much money as the Chinese spent on uh, Beijing. And so we had to be a bit creative. So you may recall that um, Her Majesty has her back to the camera in Buckingham Palace. And James Bond comes in and says, it's time, ma'am. And she turns around. Now, when I was watching that live, I would have put my mortgage on the fact that it wasn't Her Majesty, but it was. And James Bond then took her, obviously, up in the helicopter and she parachuted in to open the, uh, the Olympic Games. So uh, uh, she, was, she was a good sport. It was very cleverly done, actually. Um, the parachute came down in behind the stadium and then there was like a 10 minute delay and Her Majesty walked in wearing that exact outfit. So uh, it, was, it was great fun. All right, so a little bit of recent history. Uh, Charles married um, Diana. Um, they got married in St. Paul's Cathedral and um, had two children. There's William on the right and Harry on the, uh, on the left. And we know that sadly, uh, August 31st, 1997, uh, Princess Diana was killed in a car crash in, uh, in, in Paris. So the boys from this stage had to, uh, to grow up pretty much without uh, a mum. But happier times, William fell in love with um, Kate Middleton and they were married at Westminster Abbey. It was a great occasion. Uh, there is a, a big, long, tree-lined road that runs from Trafalgar Square to Buckingham Palace, and people were queuing up there for weeks before to get a good place to, uh, to see the, the, the couple coming out, and it was, a, it was a joyous day. You can see William is being um, married in his uh, guard's uniform, 
and uh, because he flies helicopters for the RAF, that blue sash is the Royal Air Force colour. So that was him in his uniform. He's uh, um, Colonel in Chief of the Irish Guards. And of course, we're now at this stage. So we have uh, Prince George above his dad's head. We have uh, Princess Charlotte in the middle and we have Louis in his mum's arms. And of course, you know, that's what a royal bride has to do when uh, she marries the heir to the throne. She has to produce an heir and a spare. So Kate did very well. She's got an heir, a spare and a spare. So we're, we're, we're good. Now, actually, when Kate was pregnant, um, the countries that Her Majesty is still head of state had a meeting to change the uh, fact that it would have been a boy that would have become the king. It wouldn't matter where in, you know, if she'd had three daughters and the fourth child was a boy, the boy would be king. And of course, you know, that's a completely antiquated, um, old fashioned um, system. Uh, some of our greatest monarchs have been female. And, um, and so it was changed. But as it happened, George was born and he is the, um, the, the heir to the throne. And it's for the first time in over 120 years, we have three heirs to the throne alive at the same time in descending order. So we have Prince Charles, we have Prince William, and uh, we have Prince George there. So uh, quite, uh, quite exciting. And then this happened, uh, Harry whirlwind romance um, with, uh, with an American lady, uh, actress, Meghan Markle, very happy, um, a, a major event. Again, thousands of people turned out to um, Windsor Castle and the uh, the grounds around Windsor to uh, to wish them well, and there is uh, there's Windsor Castle. Uh, it's about twenty miles outside London to the west, uh, just beyond Heathrow Airport. So if you've ever flown into London, you will uh, probably have flown across the uh, the castle. It's the world's longest continually inhabited castle, and if I can move the, uh, the cursor without the slide changing, there is the chapel down there on the bottom left-hand side, St. George's Chapel, where they got married. Um, just interestingly, the Queen's apartments, and she calls Windsor home. Uh, she calls Buckingham Palace the office, but Windsor is home. And her private apartments, I beg your pardon, so this is very lively, this uh, cursor. Whoop. Uh, the Queen's apartments are on the right hand side, about halfway down. And then you have Windsor Great Park, uh, 6,000 acres of, uh, of parkland. So uh, I could do a whole talk on Windsor Castle. I, I really like it. It's a fascinating place. And uh, it's actually in the chapel that um, Meghan and Harry got married that the Queen's parents, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, are buried. Also, the Queen's sister, Henry VIII, is in there. Another king we're going to talk about in this talk, Charles I, he's also buried in there. So they have 10 monarchs in there. They're not all in Westminster Abbey. And um, of course, what we then had was uh, the birth of uh, baby Archie. It's not short for Archibald. They didn't want that. It's just Archie. It's a Scottish name meaning brave. Uh, second name Harrison, which is very clever, Harry's son. And uh, Mountbatten, is a, a, a family name. Uh, it was originally German, it was Battenberg, but during the First World War, all things German were frowned on. So Battenberg, Batten Mountain became Mount Batten, and that's the, the family name. And of course the surname is, uh, is Windsor. Now, Harry and Meghan, as you probably know, <coughs> excuse me, um, decided that they wanted to step down from royal duties uh, there is a story that uh, Harry saw what the paparazzi did to his mum and all sorts of things. And it's not my place to, uh, to, to, to go into it other than to say that they, um, they went to Canada briefly. And uh, now I understand that they are in, uh, in California. And uh, interestingly, Harry will have to, uh, I don't want to use the word suffer, but it was very difficult. The same um, process that I did in getting my green card. Uh, so uh, he is mortal. He has to get his green card the same as I did. So we do have that in common. But uh, but good luck to them both anyway. 
Now, you know, people see the royals as not human. And I, I, I really, really hope I don't offend anybody with this uh, top to bottom set of pictures. But there are the, some members of the royal family on a balcony on some special occasion. And um, the Duke of Edinburgh has cut the cheese. Now, being a Brit and being in the United States, I'm learning all these new expressions. I'd never heard that expression. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's great. So in the middle picture, he's, um, he's cut the cheese and Harry has picked it up. Uh, Princess Anne is looking to the right to see what the fuss is about and Charles is looking at what Anne's looking at. And then the bottom picture, Harry just can't keep it in, uh, <coughs> a bit like the Duke of Edinburgh, but look at the picture of disgust on the Queen's face. I think that's just so cool. So just a bit of lighthearted disrespect at the, uh, the royal family, whom I have the utmost respect for. All right, so one of the questions posed in the advertising for this uh, um, webinar is why does the queen reign but doesn't rule? And it's to do with this guy. This is King Charles I. He was the son of King James I of Scotland. We talked about the Stuart um, who became king in 1603 and Charles became king on the death of his father in 1625. Now Charles was a very arrogant man. He believed that the, um, the king was God's anointed representative, uh, representative on earth, excuse me, and could do no wrong. And he got this pretty much from his father. Now in those days, the king could summon and dissolve parliament at will, but in our unwritten constitution, we don't have a written constitution in the UK, but in our unwritten constitution, if the king needed money for any projects, he had to summon parliament and pretty much get a rubber stamp, if you like. Well, at the end of the 1630s, the Scots tried to change the structure of their church and Charles didn't agree with this. And as head of the church, a legacy from Henry VIII, and that may be for another time as well, decided that he would teach the Scots a lesson. So he summoned Parliament and he told them that he wanted money to get an army to go north to um, tell the Scots that they, uh, they couldn't get rid of the bishops in the church. And Parliament refused him. And he was gobsmacked. And he said, how can you refuse me? I'm, I'm your king. And they said, well, the last time you summoned us to get money, we gave it to you on the understanding that you would give us some more privilege. We are parliament and you haven't done. So you're not having the money. And Charles was furious. So he marched to Scotland with as much of an army as he could cobble together. And he got his butt kicked and the Scots chased him back into England. He came back to London, he summoned Parliament again, and he said, oh, the, the Scots are in, the, uh, are in England. Give me the money, we can drive them out. And Parliament again said, well, you know, we don't dislike the Scots, you know, they're nice people. Um, this, is, this is up to you. And he was furious. And so, uh, excuse me. <coughs> so he sent soldiers to Parliament to arrest the men that he thought were the ringleaders. Chief among them was this gentleman, a man by the name of Oliver Cromwell, who was member of parliament for um, an area of Cambridge, which is uh, outside London, about 45, 50 miles northeast. Now Cromwell and the other four sort of um, rebels, if you like, they heard the king was coming and they managed to, uh, they managed to escape. And the king was so mad he actually declared war on Parliament and he moved the, uh, the court to Oxford and they set up there. But the, parliamenta the parliamentarian army stayed uh, around London because that's where the money was. And the merchants in the city of London were so fed up with the king taxing them as well separately that they thought they'd throw their lot in with the parliamentarian army. And we had what became known as the English Civil War. The fight was between the Royalists, the King's supporters, 
and the parliamentarian supporters. And here is a, a, a typical armor uniform worn by a parliamentarian soldier. Now you'll see there's a little bit of armor going on, but not like the old knights of old that used to ride together to knock each other off their horses. This gave mobility in the arms. And the reason was that we had gunpowder now and um, um, rifles had been invented. They were extremely crude, one shot, very difficult to load and fire. But if they missed, then the fighting would become um, swords. So it was a mixture of very thick leather on their arms, which a sword would, find, would be very difficult to penetrate with a, with a sword, but um, a little bit of body armor as well. Now we have recreations of battles of the English Civil War, a bit like over in the States, uh, they recreate the, um, the, the American Civil War and people dress up and um, they, they recreate some of the, the battles. You can see slung across the chest of the, uh, the guy on the right hand side in red and the guy in brown and some of the others. These were the little um, canisters of, of gunpowder. So you can imagine it was a bit of a faff to fire those things off. Now, this is a, a picture of a reenactment, obviously, um, but the battles in the early stages of the 1640s were very small scale affairs. The two armies would turn up in a field somewhere, they take a few shots at each other, and then probably go down the pub. And if you had come from, you know, America, let's say, to say, I want to see the war, you'd have to be directed to it. It really was a, a small scale situation. But it started to get more brutal. Charles brought back um, soldiers from Ireland who had been brutalizing the Irish and Cromwell said we can't keep just turning up with these farm boys, uh, we need to train them and he got his general, a man by the name of Thomas Fairfax, to train them. They became known as the New Model Army and the battles got much more bloody. In fact, per head of the population, the English Civil War killed more men in the 1640s than we lost in World War I, where we lost nearly a million men. So as a, as a head of the population, the English Civil War was the bloodiest. Now, here's a, a map where the, uh, the battles took place. You can see Oxford there, the Black Diamond uh, towards the south. The very last battle was the Battle of Naseby. You can see there, 1645 and Parliament won. Now the King was told that there was still a belief that he was God's representative. It was a serious thing having a, a, a King and they wanted him to stay King but he had to acknowledge the authority of Parliament now and Charles said that he would and uh, it was all good but behind the back of Parliament he tried to get an army from Ireland, a Catholic army, and an Ireland from, uh, sorry, an army from France, a Catholic army, because um, Charles I's wife was French and Catholic, to come and fight against Parliament. Parliament heard about this. Charles was arrested and he was put on trial for his, his life. And on January the 30th, 1649, Charles was beheaded. The only time in our history we have committed uh, what's called regicide and um, there is a, a an old engraved picture there of Charles's execution. Uh, he was brought from St James's Palace which was about maybe a 20 minute walk from here. He spent his last night there so he wasn't disturbed by the building of the, the scaffold and um, he handed his gloves and his hat to a, a friend who was there to try to give him some moral support and his last words were, uh, I acknowledge the power of Parliament but not its authority and I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible place and um, beheaded he was. And this is the building today when I do tours of um, the Westminster area, uh, we walk past, it's called Banqueting House and um, he was beheaded just outside there on the, um, where the, the three little balconies are. Now for the next 11 years, Oliver Cromwell ruled the country as Lord Protector. Now he was offered the crown, but he turned it down. He said it was corrupt. Even though he had a coronation, 
and he had his image on coins, but he wasn't he wasn't the king. And it was a it was a pretty brutal time. They were Puritans. Christmas was cancelled. Children were not allowed to play out on the street. Um, theaters were closed, and it was a it was a pretty bad time. Anyway, when he died in 1658, just before he died, obviously, he it was his prerogative to hand over the protectorship of the Commonwealth, as it was known then, to whoever he wanted. And he handed it over to this guy. This is Richard Cromwell. This is Oliver's son. And this was against all expectation because he hadn't distinguished himself in the Civil War particularly. He'd had no... Uh, high office to speak of in, in, in government, but Oliver wanted his son to take it over. And Richard inherited an almost bankrupt country. The army and parliament who'd been great um, supporters of each other during the civil war were now arguing with each other. The army said it wasn't um, getting paid. Parliament said it wasn't gonna pay them until they disbanded. And Richard was given the job of sorting it out. Now, you know, sometimes where there's a conflict, and uh, you have someone acting as an honest broker to sort it out and they fail, then both sides turn on them. And that's exactly what happened with poor Richard. He got nicknames, Tumble Down Dick, Queen Dick, and uh, Hickory Dick. And this is where we get the children's nursery rhyme, Hickory Dickory Dock from. The mouse, because he was ineffectual, ran up the clock, the seat of power, he only stayed in office for one year because he couldn't handle it and he resigned. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Hickory dickory dock. So if Matt and his team are good enough to invite me back, hopefully this will whet your appetite for the dark history of nursery rhymes, which is uh, another talk. It might be my, my, well, will be my pleasure to bring to you. Now, when Richard Cromwell resigned, a deputation from England went over to France to the son of the beheaded king who was in exile with his mother. He was also called Charles and he was invited to come back to be king on the understanding that he would, for the most part, stay out of politics. So in 1660, he came over. It was a, a period in our history known as the Restoration. We had music. We were fed up with Puritanism. Um, and uh, this guy stayed out of politics to the point that he had 27 children that we know of with 16 different mistresses. So it's no wonder they called him the Merry Monarch. Uh, his own wife wasn't able to bear children. So he was having children left, right and center with all these mistresses. And um, um, he had a very, very checkered career. And uh, any of you are into uh, to dogs, breeds of dog, if you look at his, his wig hanging down there, that's why we have King Charles Spaniels. So uh, named, for, named for him. Now, <clears throat> when I take people into Westminster Abbey, there's a little, a little chapel that I, um, as, as a guide, we're not allowed to guide in because it's very, very small. People have to keep walking. And I tell them one of the things to look for is Oliver Cromwell. And when they come out, I've already told them the story of the Civil War and they look at me a little bit strangely and they say, but wasn't he only three years old? Because there you are, look, 1658, 1661. And the reason was that when he died, he was given a full state funeral and buried in Westminster Abbey. But when Charles was restored, he went after the men responsible for killing his dad, alive or dead. And Cromwell's body was exhumed. It was put on trial in the Parliament buildings. And uh, I think he reserved the right to remain silent. And his head was hacked from his body and put on a spike outside the Houses of Parliament, where it stayed, we, we think, for about 25 years. We don't know exactly what happened to his body. But there is the plaque in Westminster Abbey on the floor, um, reminding us that uh, at least Cromwell was there for three years before uh, being disposed of. And there's a statue to him outside the, uh, the Houses of Parliament. So um, whether we're gonna get some council culture on him because he did some fairly brutal things to the, to the Irish, you know, it's not for me to say, but I will protect that with my, my life.
Anyway, so here is what the, uh, the Parliament buildings look like prior to 1834, uh, pretty much where they are today. Uh, but this was, the, uh, this was the building. But in 1834, there was a fire. And this is not the Great Fire of London. I'm sure many of you out there know the Great Fire of London of 1666, which burned down a lot of the city. This was purely the fire that burned down the Houses of Parliament. And after the fire, they wanted to, uh, to rebuild, obviously, and they held a competition and um, architects were told submit your design but your design must be in victorian gothic style gothic was all the rage in victorian times you know high pointed windows flying buttresses all of that kind of thing and this was the winning design uh, it was designed by a man called charles barry uh, completed in the 1860s and while they were building it they decided that they wanted a clock. The clock wasn't in the original plans. And so a 315 foot tower with a four faced clock was, um, was erected and everybody, pretty much anywhere in the world recognizes that as Big Ben. <coughs> but of course, you all know because you're all very clever, Big Ben is actually the bell in the top. It's not the clock. The clock, excuse me, the clock never had a name, ever. Um, you get some guides, not blue badge guides, I hasten to add, but some guides say, oh, it was called St. Stephen's Tower. It wasn't, it never, ever had a name. And actually it does have a name now because uh, to honor the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, 60 years on the, the throne, uh, the tower was named the Queen Elizabeth II Tower. But this is Big Ben, the 14 ton bell. And uh, it was cast at the same place that the Liberty Bell was at the Whitechapel Bell Foundry in the east of, uh, of London. They, uh, they took the bell up into the, uh, the tower and uh, the man who cast the bell looked at the hammer, not this one I hasten to add, but the original hammer and said, that's too heavy and the man who designed the clock, a gentleman by the name of E.J. Dent, he said, nonsense. So he was the senior one of the two and they, they left the big clapper in place. Well, within a month, the bell cracked and you can imagine how much it took to get a 14 ton bell up a 315 foot tower. They decided they were not gonna take it down. So what they did was they, um, they welded a metal plate to it. You can't see it's around the, around the other side. And they turned the bell a quarter of a turn. And that's why to this day, when you hear Big Ben, it has that very fuzzy tone, very distinctive. Pretty much everybody in the world's ever heard it, recognizes it. So uh, there's, there's Big Ben. At the moment, the, um, the clock isn't uh, working. The bell was silent. Um, they did allow it to be rung for New Year's Eve because that's a big tradition, Big Ben chiming in the new year. But the whole tower is encased in scaffolding at the moment because it's, it's pretty much rotting and they're fixing it. And the clock and the, the bell will be back in action uh, sometime we hope in early 2021 next, uh, next year. Okay, so the government today. Now I'm sorry that's a little bit blurry, but please don't, please don't panic. This is a, a map of the United Kingdom, because you can see Northern Ireland there on the, on the left. And all those little divisions there are known as constituencies. And if you look at the three shapes on the, on the right, you can see them there. There's London. That's, oh, the next one up is uh, Birmingham. And Liverpool and Manchester, because they're big urban areas. Now these, areas every four years send one person to parliament to represent them now the reason they're all different sizes is because they're nothing to do with the geographical size but it's to do with the number of people who are eligible to vote so if you look at london there the the bottom of the three cities on the on the right 
there are 73 constituencies crammed into that area because the population of London is about 8.6 million. But if you go right to the top, uh, the top of Scotland, you'll see a huge area there at the, the top. And that contains only enough voters for one constituency. So um, I hope you're still with me. Each one of these, and there are 650 in total, every four years send a representative to Parliament. So there are 650 members of Parliament in the House of Commons. Now, obviously, as an independent, you're not going to get much done. Sad to say, some independents have great ideas, but unless you have like-minded people, you're not going to do much. So just as in the States with Republicans and Democrats, um, in the United Kingdom, MPs affiliate themselves to a political party. We have the Conservatives, who are a bit like the Republicans, free enterprise, business, and so on. We have the Labour Party, uh, a little bit more socialist. Wealth should generate um, for the poorer members of society. We have Liberal Democrats. And then on top of that, in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, we have people who want to represent Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. So we have, we have quite a few political parties. We're not just limited to the to two. But the two serious contenders, the two big hitters, are Labour and Conservative. Now, this is all of those constituencies turned the colour of the party that won it in the most recent election in 2019. Now, before this election, we had, a, we had a problem because we did have the Conservative Party as the biggest party standalone. But if all the other parties got together, they would outnumber the number of MPs the Conservatives had. And that's why Brexit was dragging on and all these deals had to be done. And it was, it was nonsense. So Boris Johnson called an election and I think people were so fed up with Brexit that many of them who were traditional red voters thought you know what for four years let's just get this done and the Conservatives you can see a massive area of blue there they they won with more than half of the 650. I know this sounds complicated but if you have 650 seats what you need to do is to win more than half because if you win more than half it doesn't matter if all the others join together they can't beat you now you need to be a lot more than half rather than just one or two because people die sadly um, they resign and so on and so in the 2019 election the conservatives got a majority of 80 eight zero now you'll see the yellow at the top those are the scottish mps so you can see the whole of Scotland is Scottish nationalists. And that's what kicked off again, is Scotland going to leave the United Kingdom? You know, they want to stand alone as a, a separate country and, and, and so on. But that's for, a, that's for another day too. So there is the uh, House of Commons, the 650 um, people sitting there. We have the government on the left as we're looking, the speaker is the guy sitting in the chair right in the dead center so the government is on the speaker's right the opposition all the other parties labor the scots the the, the welsh the, you know we're all on the other side <coughs> now something very different in the uk to the united states is in the united states you pretty much vote for the president in the united kingdom you vote for the political party and it's up to them who they elect as the leader. So I don't vote directly for Boris Johnson or for anybody else. I vote for the Conservatives or I vote for the Labour. It is their business who they choose. And that's why when Theresa May, who was the Prime Minister before Boris, resigned, there wasn't an election. The ordinary people went to vote because we don't vote for them. It was up to the Conservatives and they elected Boris Johnson. Okay. Now, interestingly, you can see the two red lines on the carpet there at the bottom of the picture. 
those two red lines are exactly two sword lengths apart because in former times MPs could wear their swords into the chamber and if they um, had a falling out there would be uh, fighting would take place that's how civilized we are so to remind us of those times there are the two red lines keeping the um, um, the warring factions apart up at the top there are the press and there's also a gallery that um, you can go and see the proceedings uh, it's not as popular now as it um, used to be because it's televised now and uh, you know people can watch it on the watch it on the television and um, prime minister's questions which takes place on a wednesday morning is the one where the fireworks start because everybody's present the prime minister takes questions for an hour from the other side or from his own side his own side asking easy questions that he can give great answers to the other side um, asking the more difficult ones and uh, the tradition is that if you want to ask a question you have to submit it in writing because maybe the prime minister or whoever's answering for him might need statistics or whatever but you are allowed a supplementary question which obviously they they can plan for but they don't know exactly what it is and it can be quite heated in there and in you know typical british fashion everybody stays very very civilized but they really do have a go at each other so uh, if you watch bbc america or, or whatever see if you can find prime minister's questions uh, it's it's very very entertaining so this is um the, this is where all the the, the uh, laws are made obviously they break up into committees to discuss legislation and, and so on but this is the chamber where they all come to come together uh, once a week on a Wednesday morning now this is much more sumptuous much grander this is the House of Lords this is next door um, the House of Lords is a sort of upper chamber but not in seniority um, members of Parliament who've served for a long time who've done well are often rewarded by being elevated to the peerage it's it, it's called so they're all lord somebody in here lord or lady somebody and um, there's a lot of experience in this chamber but they can't stop the government if it's on a course of action they can delay bills that's what we call um, an act of parliament before it's actually made law it's called a bill the bill goes through they can delay it they can send it back to the house of commons for more thought but at the end of the day, uh, because of the Civil War, uh, if the Commons want to get it through, then boom, it goes through. You'll see uh, bottom right hand corner uh, sort of tucked in there is a is a throne. That's where Her Majesty comes once a year to open Parliament. And she makes a speech that's given to her by the government. And uh, all of the people from the House of Commons try to crowd in at the far end. and she will say my government wish to do this my government want to do that and and so on and it's a big state occasion <coughs> when i'm when i'm guiding in a coach it's a pain because all the roads are closed so i have to find some wiggly way to get my clients around but uh, if they see her majesty in the royal coach then uh, my tips are exponential so i like that all right so this is my hometown uh, this is Londinium. Now, there was nothing here when the Romans uh, came. They, they, came to, uh, they came to Britain twice. They came in about 55 BC under the leadership of Julius Caesar. They didn't stay very long and didn't think it was worth it. It was probably raining and they were uh, confronted by about 40,000 hairy people painted blue. And they thought, no, we're not, we're not interested. Let's go back to, uh, to Rome. I've got a nice glass of wine on the, uh, on the bar counter there. So they left. But in 43 AD, so 90 or so years later, the Emperor Claudius decided, because he was a very scholarly man, he wasn't a warlike um, um, emperor, but he wanted to, uh, to show a little bit of a spark. So he sent the Roman legions back and uh, they sailed along the uh, the river thames there that is and they looked to where all those buildings are which, there was nothing there and they thought they could build a little trading post there there were two tiny little hills that they could defend um 
there was a stream you can just about see it on the uh, on the left there sort of running down um where they could get their fresh water and the river thames much wider and much slower flowing than it is today they thought they could probably put a bridge across and they built the little trading post they could use the thames to get out into the english channel to get over to uh, to, to france and they called the trading post londinium that's where it got its name now for about 40 years it was cool but then they didn't feel quite so safe so if you look around the perimeter of london towards the top of the picture you'll see a wall so the romans built a wall around london and um, the bit with the rectangle just um, on the left hand side there uh, that was a roman camp that's where they, the soldiers were and uh, today when you walk around london if you're in this area you can see remnants of the the roman wall some quite big sections of it and um, the romans actually came in 43 a.d and they stayed until 410 so the roman occupation of britain was longer than the united states has been a country and the only reason they left was because rome was under threat from all of the tribes that they'd subjugated um, they'd taken their eye off the ball with military training they they had over 220 holidays a year in in rome because they had slaves to do all the work and they got soft and all of these tribes decided to uh, to strike back so the roman legions were withdrawn from london uh, and went back to defend the empire leaving us pretty much to fend for ourselves and so we were attacked by anybody sailing past with a pointy helmet and a sharp sword we had the vikings we had the anglo-saxons and all sorts then we get to sort of medieval times so um, this is the uh, end of the 15th century london's population is about 80,000. you can see it's all still on the north side of the river so the the, the roman camp was the start of it all you can see there's just one bridge across the river london bridge uh, that was the only bridge across the river in the central area for over 450 years uh, the first stone bridge replacing the Roman wooden one was completed in about 1210 and um, that has a, a, a history all of its own there's another talk just on uh, on London Bridge so here it is today so you can see Tower Bridge there again if I had money for everybody who looks at Tower Bridge and says oh look London Bridge because it's the one they recognize i'd be uh, very wealthy but that's tower bridge because on the right hand side it's um very very close to the tower of london you can see the you can see the tower of london with the green what used to be the moat but now filled in in uh, in grass can you see it uh, see it there there it is okay um london bridge is actually that that one at the top um just beyond the warship you can see there that's uh, hms belfast she saw action in the second world war and there is london bridge now uh not a particularly attractive bridge it's the fifth one that's been on the site and um people look at that and say that can't be london bridge but it is tower bridge that everybody recognizes the uh, the, the world over now there's about another 40 or 50 slides ladies and gentlemen i never know how far i'm i'm gonna get in a in a talk so um this is where we will end it and say there is um all things british part two where we go on from from here um so hopefully we can do that uh, an, another time i'm just going to get my um my facebook page up which should be there and so now if you have any questions if you put them through matthew i would be delighted to try and answer but uh, thank you very much i i hope uh, i wouldn't endeavor to teach you anything but i hope you were entertained by some uh, common questions that i get asked but there is plenty more where that came from that's wonderful thank you so much that was Fantastic. Um, we do have some questions that have come in. So 
I'll read those off to you. Uh, do the people of Cornwall feel a sense of independent identity like the Welsh and Scottish? That's a really interesting question. Thank you for that. Do the people of Cornwall feel an independence? Well, there is an affinity with the sort of Breton thing and the um, and, uh, and and France and, and so on. And they have their own language, although it's it's very rare to hear it still being being used. But I, I think they very much uh, feel part of um, feel part of England. Um, so so no, not not maybe like the Basques in Spain or anything like like that. Uh, they're pretty laid back down there, and I think it's uh, I think it's more traditional than warlike. <laughs> but but thank you for the question. Yeah, it's excellent. Uh, here's another one. How are the titles selected and given to the offspring of royalty, uh, such as, or ex for example, Prince Charles, titled Prince of Wales? Right. Thank you. And another another good question. Um, let's take the Prince of Wales first. Uh, um, that title. Um, is awarded to the firstborn son of the uh, of the monarch. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we we have to go back to King Edward the First, who came to the throne in 1272. Now he hated the Scots with a, a passion, and uh, in fact he was the man that killed Mel Gibson. So if you've seen Braveheart, you know that it was Edward the First of of, of England. Um, now he actually didn't like the Welsh either. And there is a story that um, he called all the Welsh chieftains together uh, to a meeting in a, in a tent somewhere. And he said to them, look guys, you know, I've been giving you a good kicking for all these years. Uh, it's time I did something nice for you. I will give you your own prince that does not speak a word of English. And they thought, great, we're gonna get a Welsh person and Edward went outside into another part of the tent and he brought in his six week old baby son, Edward, who didn't speak anything at all <laughs> and said, here is your new prince. So traditionally, that's the, uh, that's the first son. The second son is usually the, the Duke of York. And then after that, it's up to the monarch to provide whatever title he or she wants. Um, you may remember the queen made... Um, uh, William and Kate, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, when they got married. So there are dukedoms sort of lying on a shelf that maybe the person who had it before died without any offspring, and so so they've been shelved. Um, but they're they're the within the Queen's purview. Is that a posh word? The Queen's purview to uh, to hand out. You know, I I can't wait to be made the uh, the Duke of Huntley, um, but we'll see. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so that's how there. It's uh, it's either the tradition, and obviously when Charles becomes king, then he will give up his Prince of Wales status, and uh, William will be invested. And when Charles was invested as Prince of Wales, uh, the Welsh were like, oh great, you know, it's another one. But Charles made a real effort. He went and lived in uh, Wales. He studied at um, Aberystwyth University. And he learned to speak Welsh and he made his speech of acceptance in Welsh. Now, you could argue it's tokenism and all the rest of it. But, you know, for me, he, he was only a young man and he, and he made a real effort. So, uh, so I hope that's answered your question. Yeah, that's great. What government power does Queen Elizabeth have that she can lawfully exert? Um, that's a great question. What powers does Queen Elizabeth have? Absolutely none. It's why she reigns and doesn't rule. Um, you know, I, I, I think she can do things, but she gets put up to doing it as the head of state by the government. Uh, it used to be that she had to sign off on uh, all bills before they became law, but now it's just a, a, a rubber stamp. However, saying that, she has a vast experience. I mean, she's been through, don't quote me on this, 14 or 15 prime ministers in her lifetime. And uh, the prime minister currently visits the queen once a week to have tea with her and to discuss what's going on. So if the queen is looking out the window and seeing poll tax riots or whatever, you know, she's gonna have the prime minister in and gonna ask him, but fundamentally, uh, she has she has no power. 
I mean, you could argue she could declare war or whatever, but she's, she, she's not going to do it randomly, trust me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a, a big question. Is Brexit a good idea for Great Britain? Oh, my goodness. How long have you, how long <laughs> have you got? Uh, on the one hand, having a group of nations that got together to trade rather than go to war with each other um, as it evolved, was you know was a good idea uh, open borders goods and services being able to to go between the two people being able to um, travel to get work in other countries without documentation and so on the problem i think came that how can i how can i put this we're we're a very small island you know that England has a population of, you know, 62 million on that small, that small island. And a lot of people came from Europe to work in England. And the reason they did that was because, you know, most people, whatever country you come from, you learn English in school. So they understood maybe some of the, 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 the language. And also, you know, we are a, a nation of benefits. The health service is, um, you know, social medicine and people from the EU are entitled to be treated in England um, on the National Health Service, just as I would be if I went to France or whatever, which on paper you might think is a good thing. But they thought there would be maybe a 19, 20,000 input of people. Well, we had 380,000. This put strain on medical facilities, it put strain on housing, it put strain on jobs, and it wasn't managed very well. I mean, the people who were coming from Europe were great. You know, we welcomed them. We're a you know, diverse society. They were bringing all these skills and cultural stuff, and it was great. But instead of um, taking their tax money and building new schools and building new housing and, and so on, it just went off to pay the national debt. And so what you had was a lot of people who were resentful that they couldn't get their kid into the local school because um, there were other nationalities filling it up and, and, and so on. And I think Middle England, if you call it that, voted because the government really thought that people would vote to stay in. I mean, David Cameron, who was prime minister at the time, he only had the referendum to appease some of the conservatives who are very much sort of jingoistic British, you know, we want to have a referendum. And David Cameron was so confident that if he gave them the referendum, the British people would vote to stay, that it kind of knocked him sideways when, you know, it was 51 to 49%, but, but leave it was. So there are all sorts of benefits to, to, to staying that a lot of people don't hear about. It's not in the, it's not in the media. But when the government in Brussels tells the British that their sausage, their banger, has to be a particular length or size and must contain, you know, this, that and the other, people got upset about it. And I know that's, I'm being flippant about, about that. But there were so many of those that we, did, you know, we um, didn't like to be governed by people in Brussels, even though we kind of elected them, if that makes sense. So um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, the good things... There, there, there won't just be blanket immigration now. People will come with skills and, uh, and, 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 and so on. Um, that'll take the pressure off the National Health Service, which, uh, trust me, is a, is a great system. I mean, I watch some of these political commentators say, do you want social medicine like in England? You know, they take babies away from their parents and stuff. I mean, none of that is true. It's just, you know, it's nonsense. I can walk into any hospital in the UK and get and get treatment. And it's not second rate treatment. I, I before I came here in 2017, I had a, a cancer scare and I saw the top man in Europe for this particular thing. And we do have private medicine, but the doctors who work in the private sector also work in the public sector. They may do two days private, three days public. The only difference is you may have to wait for something like a knee replacement or a hip replacement but if it's cancer or heart or life-threatening you're you're in as a priority and I had the best treatment ever um, paid for by my taxes of course and of course you know let's not be silly here we pay 
eight times what you do for a tank of gas. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, you know, swings and roundabouts, we, 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 we say. So, you know, it remains to be seen. We'll be able to do trade deals with Australia and India and the United States. Although we're not going to buy your chlorinated chicken. Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, but we can do deals. Whereas if you're in the EU, you're obliged to trade with other EU partners. I mean, obviously, you know, you're in a trading gang. Um, but other countries get left out. So exciting times. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, and the question here, uh, who is the Queen's favourite Prime Minister? Favourite Prime Minister? That's really hard. I, I know uh, she had a lot of time for Sir Winston Churchill because he was her first Prime Minister. Um, and this is only hearsay now. I mean, I don't want anybody rushing off and phoning up Fox News and saying this English guy said. Um, but I, I don't think she had a lot of time for Margaret Thatcher. Um... I think she liked Sir Edward Heath, the Conservative Prime Minister. I think she came round to Tony Blair. If any of our guests tonight have seen the movie The Queen or remember the death of Diana, uh, Tony Blair steered her through a very difficult time um, and um, got her back to being popular again. So I don't think she liked him to start with. I mean, The Queen is very much a traditionalist and new labor were all very, you know, whatever. And I don't think she, she liked him, but he, he stepped up to the plate and um, on that issue. Um, and I, I think she changed her, her opinion, but that's a really good question. Uh, if the person who asked it would like to um, find my Facebook page, I'll see if I can do some research for you and I'll answer it on the, uh, on the Facebook page. That's wonderful. Well, thank you again so much, John, for your time and your expertise. Oh, my pleasure, Matthew. Thank you for having me. So fascinating and a lot of comments here saying thank you and everyone really appreciates uh, what you um, had to share. And oh, thank you. any other questions you have, feel free to uh, find John on Facebook and um, hopefully we will be able to connect with you again in the future. Uh, he does post there, I think, whenever he's got an online program like this. And so uh, that's, that's really great. Feel free to follow him on Facebook. And you can find us also on Facebook, uh, Sandwich Public Library. And uh, you can find us on our website, www.sandwichpld.org. We've got some other great online uh, programming coming up in webinar format like this. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Well, thanks again, John, for your time and have a great night. Thanks yes, you time. too, Matthew, and thank you. I know it's very challenging for librarians having to do things like this. I'm very appreciative that you, you, you do this for your community. So that's great. Yeah. Have a great night. Great evening. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.